after I give a presentation like this, I usually find I agree with about three quarters of what I just said. Uh, the rest of it is sort of work in progress and thinking in progress. The great pleasure of being an academic, of course, is that you don't have to come up with any answers. You can just ask a lot of very difficult uh, and annoying questions. Um, the first of the annoying questions that I like to try and, uh, and approach is, is a relatively straightforward one. There's some really interesting stuff coming from the pollsters. Now, I, I, Greg's got some great stuff there about the snapshot of where the public is now. I think it's really interesting to ask, but why has the public got to that sort of view? Where, where have these deep currents actually come from? Why is it that the safest large-scale source of energy which we have yet come up with is considered by enough people to make it a question in many countries as to whether it's going to continue, and indeed in some countries make it clear it's not going to continue. Um, despite that uh, uh, basic uh, uh, safety record. To put it a slightly different way, how was it that Fukushima, a kind of middle-ranking, annoying industrial accident of the sort that I guess happens eight or ten times somewhere in the world every year, uh, turned from being that into actually what is a very significant scale uh, human and, and, and economic tragedy uh, in Japan? In any objective sense, when nuclear power goes wrong, it does not go wrong big. Fukushima is a tiny accident in its actual health effects, zero as far as we can tell. The response to it, as I say, has turned it into a really very major th issue. But why is it that people have that very deep belief that uh, big nuclear accidents are big on the scale of, of, of issues like uh, of, uh, uh, any sort of industry? Um, as a starting point, and there's another study just come out today emphasizing this, at all of the three events that we talk about, Three Mile Island, Fukushima and Chernobyl, the psychological effects massively outweigh the somatic effects caused by uh, radiation. One way that I quite often put it is that it's a very serious question now is how do we protect people from radiological protection? Because radiological protection is lethal, Radiation is actually a pretty bad way, unless you're going to do it seriously, like they did with Litvinenko in London a decade ago. Unless you're really going to put your mind to it. Radiation is actually not that good a way of causing damage. Why would it be? We've evolved into a world where it's all over. And yet, something has gone on that has created uh, that sort of message. Um, and I'm going to argue that a lot of that has come not from the anti-nuclear movement, but actually from the positioning on some of these issues. I'm never quite sure when, when uh, hearing a, a, an expert presentation like Greg's how far I disagree with him, but I definitely do disagree with him to a considerable uh, extent, and perhaps in the Q&A we'll, we'll tease out how far that actually goes. Um, as a scientist, I don't like the word irrational as an explanation for anything. The, the explanation for this is it has no explanation. The reason this is happening is it has no reason. Um, and I, I'm going to suggest, actually, that the public is extraordinarily rational. We as a species are extraordinarily rational. We have got where we got to, which is a very impressive place, because we do, generally speaking, manage to respond in a sensible way to what's uh, in front of us. And the common sense rationality of the everyday world is actually, at the end of the day, just as effective, if not more so, as the scientific rationality. I wonder how many of you, when you're out there looking at objects, think of them in Heisenbergian terms of that bus coming towards me. I don't know exactly its position or its momentum, so I'm not sure it's going to cause me any damage or not. Or do we all go back to Newton and, and, and uh, uh, an earlier uh, way of looking at the world? So the traditional response, I think, to, of the nuclear family, the industry, its supporters, uh, uh, regulators and the like, maybe, um, to, to the sort of issues that, that, that Greg's just been talking about, it usually goes along the line of the public is irrational. Sometimes it's about a lack of information, but often it's about irrational. Uh, somebody, probably yeah, media, green, big green industry, someone like that, is going around misinforming people about uh, uh, radiation and about nuclear power. And all we really need to do uh, in dialogue, you know, it started off about being a matter of, of, of informing the public, then it was about educating the public. Now we have honest and open two-way dialogues at the public until the public gets it right, until the public realizes that it's completely uh, misunderstood this whole thing. In other words, the fundamental model is it's a deficit model. There's something wrong with the public that just doesn't get this kind of stuff. And through effective communication, we can put that deficit uh, right. Actually, I think someone has been going around stoking up uh, unmerited uh, fears about radiation, but it ain't the people that uh, uh, are usually uh, thought of as the, as the culprits. 
First thing to say, is there a fear of radiation out there? I'm sorry about the size of this, but this is just a few of the incidents causing death with radiation that had nothing to do with nuclear power. Not many people have died because of the short-term effects of radiation since the Hiroshima and Nagasaki bombs. I think it might be around 150, something in that sort of region. But most of those, a majority of those, have happened as the result of medical radiation material either being stolen or being left behind in, in medical facilities and getting out into the environment in some sort of way. And yet it doesn't seem that there is any significant radiophobia associated with those sorts of, of incidents. When Mr Litvinenko was murdered with polonium 210 uh, in, in London 10 years ago, you could detect the stuff in taxis, you could detect it in restaurants, you could detect it in hotel rooms. Nobody had any fear of it, basically I believe, because nobody bothered going around telling them not to worry about it. So they didn't. You know, why would you bother worrying about something unless someone came up and told you that it was perfectly all right? Uh, so as a result, this was a KGB story, and the, the media talked about the KGB, and everyone thought this was the uh, it was a KGB story. Obviously, oh, oh I'm not. Sure. <laughs> if I don't see any of you again, you'll know who got me. Um, but this was clearly uh, clearly was uh, uh, there, and radiation. Yeah, I think people were aware that this was a radioactive substance, but there wasn't that sense of of radiophobia that you get associated with nuclear power. My favourite illustration of this was that in Budapest in 2011 there was some iodine-131 detected in the environment and everyone got very worried in case there'd been an undisclosed accident either at PAX or at one of the nearby stations. After a while they discovered it was a leak from the Radio, uh, Radio Isotopes Institute of Budapest where they do the research on medical radiation and there was a palpable sigh of relief. Thank goodness this is the nice iodine-131 associated with medicine, <laughs> not the nasty stuff associated with, with nuclear power. And so everyone cheered up. So, and in the UK, there was a huge campaign trying to worry people in the southwest of the country about build-up of radon in, uh, in housing spaces. Got absolutely nowhere. And again, I suspect if they'd gone around telling people, you might have heard about all this radon, but it's perfectly okay, nothing to worry about, they might have managed to get people worried. But going around and telling people, your house that you and your parents have lived in for generations is dangerous. It's just not going to engage people uh, with uh, what was, I still don't think it was worth bothering with. But, but if there had been a, an issue there, the, the way to do it was, was not to do it that. So, uh, you know, when it comes to aircraft, when it comes to medicine, when it comes to almost every context in which radiation is there, there is no radiophobia. The public has a perfectly accurate and uh, rational, uh, sorry, perfectly accurate and proportionate response to the risks of radiation, with one exception and that is radiation in the context of nuclear power. Something about the way the industry has communicated radiation in the context of nuclear power over the last 50 years has caused an enormous fear of radiation that is not there in the natural public, is, is, is my suggestion. Um, having said all of this, I do not want to row back. I'm not suggesting it's implicit. The issues of the start with the atomic bomb are relevant factors, but nonetheless, I, I, I strongly suspect that there's a lot in that. Because what people hear when there's things like, after Fukushima, this must never happen again, you don't get any other industries talking in those sorts of terms. BP was actually very strongly criticised for not saying the Gulf of Mexico thing will never happen again. But of course, yeah, I don't know if it's policy on the part of the oil industry to have a major oil leak every 10 years. It, 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 I, I don't know. But if it is policy, goodness me, it's a sensible one. Because every 10 years, we see a huge amount of oil in the environment. We see it goes away. We see it's actually environment can cope with this sort of thing. And what's more, we get a chance to hammer the oil industry so we all feel comfortable uh, about it. And therefore, there is not the kind of fear about oil that actually, I suspect, in environmental terms, would probably be considered considerably more merited than the equivalent uh, fear of, of radiation. There seems to be a, a sense in which the way nuclear industry talks about a major nuclear accident as if it would be in a different league from anything else that happens in the environment, that ends up pe with people thinking that a major nuclear accident will be in a different league from anything else that happens in the environment. I don't think that's irrational. I think there's a considerable question over the rationality of the industry and its communicators in this, but from the public's point of view, a perfectly sensible response to what they see going on in front of them. And we take into account some of the stuff that uh, I, I think is absolutely, and I totally agree with Greg on this, if you start making something fun and interesting, and the, so the social context in which, and the psychological context in which the messages are being given, and we had some of that in the, in the lunchtime talk as well, 
That does make a big difference there as to how people uh, respond to, to this. But if you're, totally, if you're going on to people saying, really, you should support nuclear energy, basically the message is, so it's not quite as bad as you thought it was, then that's unlikely to end up with people being able to make a, a response to, to, uh, to, to this. And that's broadly what I think actually happens. It seems to me in risk perception, there's, there's maybe three broad assumptions. Firstly, an assumption that people get worried because they see things to worry about. Uh, secondly, that every time that we tell people we've made something a bit safer, people will get a bit more relaxed about it. And third, that if we just give people accurate information, that's all it's really about, that will make those perceptions more rational, even if the accurate information just cannot be made sense of when you stand it against what you actually see this industry doing uh, in, in, in reality. Now, I think all three of those are questionable. I think, actually, most of us just live our lives at a pretty constant level of, of, of misery. And it, it just, it doesn't matter what's going on in the environment terribly much. If everything's going wrong, then that's why we're unhappy. If everything uh, gets better and we, and, and we don't have the big problems, then we start getting worked up about where we left the car keys or, in societal terms, things like vaccination against measles and mumps or mobile phone towers or genetically modified food or low level radiation. But we don't, broadly speaking, change. Our, it differs from person to person. You know, there's some people who seem to be able to take absolutely everything in their stride, others who get uh, fed up no matter what it is. Uh, so in that case, the approach to risk perception may be far more a matter of saying, what am I doing that actually makes my activity a reasonable candidate for people to say subconsciously, well, I'm pretty anxious about something. I can't see anything terribly big, but it must be something making me anxious. Ah, that's what it is. Yes, it's, it's radiation. I, that's what I'm worried about there because of the way these people are talking about it. Um, in terms of, uh, so I say, times of real stress, then people know what the problems are and these little issues tend to be less uh, front of mind, but we still need to find something. You may still, it may be in evolutionary terms, those of our ancestors who were pretty sort of stressed out most of the time and were worried about what was about to happen to them, uh, I suspect probably were a bit more successful in passing their genes on to the really sort of laid back Dylan-esque hippie type uh, uh, ancestors who would lay around taking everything in their stride and, and subsequently get, getting eaten. Um, so, yeah, th there may be good evolutionary reasons for this, but nonetheless, the question then arises, you know, what makes a good candidate risk for this? Well, I suspect some of the things are, is if the people giving the risk don't seem to connect with the things that I'm actually interested in in life, if they seem a bit full of themselves, if their messages just don't make sense, uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, Basically speaking, you just answer this question by looking at the way the nuclear industry has communicated over the last 50 years, because a whole string of things have been done which I think have absolutely put nuclear as a very credible candidate for people to hang that kind of sense of, of unease that they, that, that they may have. So my suggestion then is that broadly speaking, the public, and that include the media in that, who often come in for a bad time with this, are rational, and the industry itself is actually staringly irrational in the way that it thinks its messages are going to go down. One or two examples. Radioactive waste is not very dangerous. The waste agency in the UK used to say it's about medium level waste, about as dangerous as petrol and paint stripper. If you look after it properly, it's okay. Could do you a bit of damage with that. The on saying it's so harmless, we're going to bury it 800 metres underground in an area where there's no groundwater, where what groundwater there is is moving at a slower rate than the centimetre a century, uh, where the uh, rocks are such that the material will stick to the rocks rather than move with the solvent front, and where there's no seismic activity that's measurable. You know, What's the rational person to make? And this isn't the Green movement saying this. This is the nuclear industry telling them about what they're going to do with the waste. Well, firstly, people know we just don't do that to anything else. Nobody else is coming around telling them that's what they're going to do. So message number one is this is the most dangerous stuff that mankind has ever created. Actually, it's in a category of its own because we don't do this with anything else. And secondly, if these jokers think that I'm going to believe them when they come around to tell us we're just being perfect, but very safe here, it's nothing really to worry about, then they're insulting my intelligence and I'm not going to believe a single word that they're going to say in the future. And yet the nuclear industry actually goes out and voluntarily tells people that this is what it's intending to do with the waste. Um, safety is the top priority. That's uh, one of EDF's corporate messages. What does that mean? You know, safety is more important than generating electricity. Safety is more important than reducing carbon emissions. Because there's a very easy answer to that. If safety really is the top priority. I've got the answer for you. Just stop. 
Stop doing what you're doing. Then you'll be perfectly safe. You'll not hurt anybody if you just stop doing it. And yet that's what the nuclear industry is saying is important to it. Not, and uh, yeah, Greg's absolutely right, you don't hide these things, you don't not talk about them, but to lead with them, to say that is your uh, uh, priority out there, is, is uh, creating an impression that this is just in a different league from any other sort of problems that we might have faced. I went across to uh, Hong Kong after Fukushima. Um, they've got a massive uh, uh, radiation monitoring network there, really super duper, spent a lot of money on it. A week after Fukushima, they said, we've detected radiation now from, or radioactivity from, from the accident. It took them a week to calibrate it, and they came out with saying, levels here are about 153 thousandth of the levels at which you ought to get concerned. And again, what's the rational person to make of this? You're either telling me that you spent a fortune of ultimately my money on a system to tell me that this is 153 thousandth of where I should get worried about it, in which case I'm not going to trust you with another cent of my money if I can avoid it. Or far more likely, you know full well this stuff is dangerous. That's why you set up the, 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 the network, and now you're just lying to me to try and, uh, and, and keep my, uh, my mind at rest. But it's got to be one or the other of those, and it's not automatically obvious that by dissuading people from the most obvious conclusion, which is you're lying about this, this really is dangerous, and persuading them, no, actually, you're okay, because actually all this is being run by people who are completely irresponsible with your money and will spend it like water. That's not automatically going to bring hearts and minds around to supporting the, 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 the concept. Fukushima, yeah, we're still several tens, if not 100,000 people, can't return to their homes, Fukushima. People's lives ripped apart the estimates do suggest that more people in Fukushima Prefecture have died as a result of the response to Fukushima than died as a result of the earthquake and the tsunami. If it wasn't so tragic, that would actually be quite an extraordinary achievement uh, with that. And you, know, you would not destroy the lives of people. You would not condemn so many people to death in that sort of way unless the radiation in the area around Fukushima was absolutely lethal. Would you? And yet the authorities are saying it's not actually all that bad in the area. What's the rational person to make of those two messages being given at the same uh, time? Um, they set levels uh, below you know, a fifth of the national level for radiation. So food that was perfectly safe before Fukushima, that was nowhere near, near Fukushima, has become dangerous now because of that change in the regulatory limit. And the tragedy is one suspects they were doing this to put people's minds at rest. And the public is the irrational one. Let me just um, finish off with, with I, I was across at the Japan Atomic Industry Forum conference a couple of years ago. And one of the speakers was saying, it goes back to this information point, we are, Japanese public just doesn't understand that man-made radiation and natural radiation have the same health effects. Uh, all we've got to do is persuade them of this, make them understand this, and uh, opposition to nuclear power will collapse. Well, again... Let me suggest what the, the, the intelligent Japanese knows or can get in, in access for. He knows that places like Misasu, which is their version of, of, of Radium Springs or, or the, the many you know, high radiation level uh, uh, health spas around the world, uh, gives levels of radiation that the authorities say are very significantly higher than you get in the evacuation zone or exclusion zone around Fukushima. And nobody would dream of saying you can't go there. In fact, they sell themselves as health spas. And they know that people's lives have been completely destroyed by refusal to allow them back into their homes around Fukushima. And yet they're being told that the levels of radiation there are considerably lower. Now, there's probably three possible explanations for that. One is the authorities are either evil or have simply gone mad and have treated the people around Fukushima in a way that they would never dream of treating people with a similar level of risk elsewhere if it was natural radiation. Or that the authorities are simply lying about the levels of contamination in the exclusion zone around Fukushima. It's actually far, far higher than they're letting on. Or natural radiation is much less harmful than man-made radiation. It must be one of those three explanations. At the moment, people go for the one that actually is the one least likely to cause problems in public perception terms, the third one. If you could persuade them it wasn't that, you wouldn't remove from them the obligation to try and make sense of what they see going on in front of them. You'd simply push them into one of the other two. I suspect they go into the second one, because they've been lied to so many times in, in Japan about uh, the nuclear industry. But maybe they'd go into the first one, which is actually the one that's right, 
is it automatically the case that that would result in people feeling more comfortable with the activities of the nuclear industry uh, in uh, Japan? So far from people being misinformed by malign influences around all this, it could be that a lot of this fear, as I say, in the context of looking for something to, to, to justify your basic levels of concern, come from the fact that the nuclear industry behaves in such a way to give people a very good uh, uh, reason uh, for thinking that this is, is, is really pretty uh, dangerous uh, uh, stuff. I would say it's not, I, well, I, that's in the, in, in the pack with that. I would say I don't think there is very strong evidence facts. I mean, even Greg's slides show that the people who knew the answer to two questions were significantly less likely to be pro-nuclear than the people who knew the answer to one question. There's quite a lot of research in the UK suggests that those who support and oppose nuclear energy have broadly the same levels of knowledge, and those who don't have a view are, have significantly less knowledge. And let's bear in mind that as with all causative relations, it could be either way around. It could be that those who are interested enough in nuclear power to have a feeling about it are the ones who go out and educate themselves and pay attention when a news story is there. Um, but broadly speaking, I think the core irrationality in all of this might be believing that if you go and tell someone you've made something safer, far from that putting their minds at rest, the obvious rational response is, so this was considerably more dangerous than it used to be. You used to think it was, and you used to tell us that it was. Uh, and what, for all I know, you're going to come back in five years and tell us the same thing again. And of course, unfailingly, the nuclear industry does, because in five years they're back saying, we've made this even safer. What do you make of the concept that I hear in the UK, these nuclear stations are safer than the ones that have never, ever had an accident? What does that mean to people? Just that we've been fortunate, massively lucky that we haven't had a massive accident? In the yeah, again, who's thinking about what the rational response to all of this is? Um, one thing I would really, really seriously question as a final point. I believe the only way you can get people's attention enough to educate or inform them about something that has as little direct effect on their lives as nuclear energy, when it's competing with 10 or 20 other scientific issues, let alone what the standard of education or healthcare or whatever is in the area, the only way you'll grab the attention of people sufficiently to make them think it's worth educating themselves on this is if they, you can persuade them that it's dangerous enough and scary enough they really ought to know something about it. The very act of turning up at someone's door and saying you ought to know about this, I believe is part of the reason why people are concerned. Very, very few industries talk about we've got to educate the public around here. Most of them would actually rather have a bored public because a bored public is the best kind of public if you want to get on with doing what you're doing. Um, this is carbon capture and storage, uh, where they go have a group of people uh, interested in this who classified themselves there and given some information. The ones who were pro beforehand were slightly more pro. The ones who were anti didn't change much. And almost all of those who had no opinion ended up opposing the, the, the concept. There's other things that aren't quite as stark as that, but the idea of education and uh, 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 information really has to be looked at very, very critically. This is the uh, graph of public perception in the UK over the last uh, few years. It's rather a nice one to look at. I'm a bit sceptical about some of these figures because uh, it, I think it is quite back of mind. When I first joined the industry, the uh, nuclear industry used to go out and say, do you want to freeze to death next winter? And people say no, and that was a tick for nuclear power. Uh, <laughs> The Green Movement would say, do you want to see your wife and children or husband and children blown into atomic dust? Typically about 74% of people say no to that, so that's, uh, th that's an answer against nuclear power. But when you're looking at the same question over time, you're probably looking at something there. If you were to superimpose on that a graph of how much spending there's been on public information and public education in the UK, there's a direct correlation between the amount being spent on education and the number of people opposed to nuclear power. We broadly stopped trying to educate the people through the 2000s, and unsurprisingly, public perceptions went back to where they would have been had we not spent so long scaring them about it in the first place. Um, this is the EDF advertising campaign that started at the end of last year. That's what they are showing on the television. EDF Energy, helping to power UK homes with low carbon nuclear electricity. They have now got to the point of saying, talking about nuclear electricity will give us a competitive advantage over the other electricity uh, thing. And I think they're right. But look at the way it's done. Not in a sort of, you know, we, you've got to understand this. We want to educate you. It's just like, like any other business, this is what we do. We make electricity. Actually, we make low-carbon electricity, which is a jolly good thing. And if you're interested, we do it with nuclear. 
But such a normal, business-like way of doing it, without all this fuss about we've got to educate the public, we've got to have, yeah. And I, I think this is a real sign that uh, actually safety can go away uh, as an issue over time. People in the UK saw Fukushima, thought, what the heck has all this fuss been about over these years? Uh, if nobody gets hurt by a plant when it behaves like that. George Monbiot, one of the environmentalists uh, who came over to nuclear, said, you know, this shows us nuclear going wrong is better than coal going right. Yeah, that's the fact of the matter. Would you guess that from the way the nuclear industry has talked about safety over the years? I don't think so. So there we are. My final, final, let's just go on to this here. It's, I think there's a kind of assumption this is about communication, a great product that hasn't been properly communicated. I'm increasingly coming to think, no, the problem is if the nuclear industry behaves in a way that actually gives the impression that, that, that radiation is massively dangerous in the nuclear power context, then it doesn't matter how well that's communicated, people are still going to be scared about it because it's actually the actions that are the problem here. And that, I think, changes the, the, the communication debate in quite a profound way. What we do know is something that was true not just in cities but outside of cities and it's that people seek energy. Always have, always will. Because a life with energy is a life with security, safety, opportunity. A life without energy is probably a very short one. And in the choice between dirty energy and no energy, humans choose dirty energy every time and that's never going to change.